record now. Um, okay, so we may get a, a couple more people coming along, but um, uh, I think we should probably start. So um, thank you very much, um, Anna Bosman, for, for coming to give a talk today to um, uh, in the Shock Lab seminar series. Um, Anna is a senior lecturer um, uh, in computer science uh, at the University of Pretoria. Um, and as she did your, her PhD thesis on particle swarm optimization, I believe, is that correct? That's actually not correct. My master's oh. was on particle swarm optimization. Oh, it was a master's. PhD, I switched to, to the lost landscapes. So okay. that's how I really got stuck into this field, which I think Okay, really very beautiful. good. Um, so we, we've actually got some students here who I'm, I'm teaching a course at the moment and they're doing particle swarm optimization. So there are some some nice connections there anyway. But so I, I saw uh, Anna give um, a, a similar talk to the one she's going to give today at the Deep Learning in Darbar and thought it was fantastic. Um, and so we're extremely happy to have her um, talking here today. So Anna, over to you. Thanks so much. If you don't mind, I'll just quickly start the time on my side because I'm really terrible at keeping time. And it's the afternoon, so... I don't want to take longer than necessary. All right. um, yeah, thank you, everyone. So I've already been introduced to just, um, I guess, a summary of that. To clarify, my PhD was indeed on lost landscape analysis of the neural networks. It has the word fitness there in front. Um, and the reason for it is fitness landscape analysis is actually a research field that kind of originated in the evolutionary computing um, research field. It was basically people working on evolutionary algorithms who wanted to understand um, just various training dynamics of evolutionary algorithms in various discrete domains. And for that, they developed a whole bunch of methods to quantify properties of the search space, such as is the search space rugged or is it very smooth? Is it searchable or not searchable? Is my GA likely to get stuck or not, etc. So fitness, uh, fitness landscape analysis for a while focused on discrete problems, but eventually the evolutionary guys found a way to continuous optimization problems. Um, and meanwhile, concurrently, the, the neural networks people were also trying to understand the optimization problem of neural networks. When you train a neural network, what exactly do you train? How does the landscape look? And um, the two fields didn't exactly I guess we're not exactly aware of one another. So my in my PhD, I basically took some of the methods from the FLA fields and applied them to neural networks. And of course, along the way, I discovered some new ways, new methods, and made some interesting discoveries. And today I'm going to talk about some of those things. Okay, so let's begin at the beginning. For, first and foremost, I assume since, I mean, we all technically qualify to be members of the AI society, we'll probably all have seen a neural network before, but just a quick refresher, a neural network is this complex mathematical model capable of mapping any nonlinear function between inputs and outputs. How, do you, how exactly do you train a neural network? Well, you give some inputs, you pass them through your network, multiply them by the weights, pass it through the activation functions, etc., and eventually at the output layer, you get some output, right? Usually neural networks are trained from a random starting point. So you begin by initializing your weights to just random values and you want to find out what the best values are. And that's typically done iteratively. Once you get your outputs, you compute the loss, right? The error of the function and then simply differentiate it and follow the gradients to minimize the error by iteratively updating the weights. So when we speak of a loss landscape of a neural network, what exactly um, do we mean by that? Essentially, it is um, the mapping, right, from the parameters that you optimize to the error function. And as we all know, the loss itself does not map directly onto each and every weight. It's a composite function, so the loss is defined in terms of the outputs. The outputs, of course, are calculated by some activation functions, and to get those outputs, you have to multiply the outputs of the previous layer by the weights, etc. But at, when you get to the bottom of it, of course, uh, at the end of the day, the loss that you get is primarily dependent on the weight values that you have set for your network. So the loss landscape is essentially this idea that we can, uh, we can, we can kind of imagine the search space that your gradient descent, for example, is traversing as, as a landscape. 
And of course, this is a metaphor because in reality, neural network loss landscapes are quite high dimensional, but for us human beings, actual landscapes, you know, landscapes that we hike through are more relatable. Let's try to visualize it just in three-dimensional worlds. What exactly does your algorithm see when you start at a random point and you say, okay, go follow the gradients, find the best minimum that you can find. Is it going to tread through the desert? That's all flat and sandy. Is it going to climb over dangerous peaks, uh, fall into ravines, clamber back up, or maybe get stuck there forever? Or is it going to have a pleasant, jolly walk down the rolling hills of the Shire, right? We don't exactly know that ahead of uh, time. In fact, neural network training is usually this very black box experience where you randomize the weights, you run your algorithm, and some thousand epochs later, you just arrive somewhere. And we tend to underappreciate this hike that the algorithm takes, the experience that it has, and the consequences of particular characteristics of the landscape. Now, in this case, if the landscape was very flat, uh, going through the desert would probably be much harder for a gradient descent than walking down hills where gradient information is much, uh, much more evident, right? There are obviously steeper gradients here. And similarly, if there is too much gradient, perhaps if your peaks are too sharp, if the ravines are too narrow, maybe it would be your algorithm would be more likely to get stuck. So going from metaphors to kind of something more relatable to us all, um, of course, we're not going to be going through deserts or forests or anything like that, but there will be some search space, there will be some algorithm, and your algorithm will somehow traverse the search space to get to a minimum. So what exactly um, can we gain from understanding the lost landscape? Quite a few things, as a matter of fact. First of all, um, if you know the properties of the landscape, perhaps you can predict how well a particular algorithm will actually do in that particular type of landscape. And once you discover the minimum, if you manage to somehow classify the minima based on some of, their some of their properties as better or worse, perhaps uh, once you discover the minimum, you know if you should keep it or keep searching for a better minimum. So maybe some minimums are better than other. Um, in particular, of course, there are lots of minima out there that you can find, but uh, one million dollar question is how do you find the ultimate minimum that has the error of zero and also has a generalization error of zero. You don't just want to find a good training error, but uh, you know you want to both your training and test error to be zero. And of course, if you understand the properties of the landscape, you might be able to leverage them somehow and actually design algorithms that take those properties into account. So perhaps this is a key to design new algorithms that do better than just you know run of the mill gradient descent. And finally, a question I am quite interested in, but don't have any answers to yet. Perhaps if we study the landscapes um, of neural networks and we understand them well, perhaps we can even propose methods to transform the landscapes, modify them somehow, reparameterize them to make them simpler for our algorithms to traverse. So hopefully I've convinced you and everybody is now on board and everybody agrees that looking at the landscape has its benefits potentially. Question is, how exactly are we going to do that? So if you look at the picture on the left, um, I borrowed it from this nice website link here. Generally in my slides, all the sources are, are present. Um, it's a nice, nice um, animation that basically shows the behavior of a whole bunch of popular optimizers on a very, very simple problem with a little saddle point here where in one dimension the problem is convex and in the other dimension is concave. So it kind of looks like a saddle. And in this particular very trivial case, we can clearly see that some algorithms take longer than others to escape from the saddle. And I mean, some do not escape from the saddle at all, right? So once again, shape um, of, of, the, of the landscape matters. But uh, something like this is really nice to look at. However, Perhaps it doesn't quite, oh, I see that maybe it's a question. Oh, great, cool. If there are questions, I'll also try to keep an eye out in the chat, so feel free to post your questions in the chat. But anyway, so this is all good and well, although unfortunately the picture on the left is in no way uh, directly relevant to neural networks. Yes, sure, there are several points in neural network landscapes potentially, but what is important is 
on the left, uh, this, this landscape, right, technically only has two dimensions, x1 and x2, and the y is just, you know, the loss value corresponded to those particular two dimensions. Um, as you know, neural networks tend to be much more complex than that. Even for the extremely simplistic X or gates problem, we typically need nine weights. If you count all the biases and whatnot to model it, it's like probably the simplest nonlinear problem known um, to us. And even that nine weights is actually too much for a human mind to comprehend, right? And conveniently visualize. If we take it further and consider modern neural networks, such as ChatGPT architecture, for example, um, that's much more than nine, 170 trillion weights to be more or less precise. And of course, that just doesn't fit right into our version, three-dimensional version of reality. So what are we going to do? We want to look at the landscape, but we have a ridiculous number of dimensions that clearly is not easily visualizable. So um, we have a slight problem. Thankfully, um, there are multiple different ways in which we can reduce the dimensions. And ideally, um, of course, one can just say, you know, use some dimensionality reduction techniques. And there are quite a few studies that, um, you know, do that. But specifically in this talk, I want to focus on the methods that do not just reduce the dimensionality and give you some kind of a UMAP or TSME representation of how different dimensions correlate to one another in 2D, but rather how do we take a realistic slice, right, of the search space that truly shows you how it looks, at least for a few selected dimensions. And let's perhaps start with the simplest option of them all. And this is something that has been proposed already in the 90s by neural network researchers who were also curious about lost landscapes. They said, well, the simplest way to reduce the dimensionality is just to pick two or three dimensions at random and plot that. And this has indeed been done. These figures on the left um, are from a paper published in 1992. And this is essentially from a network, I think, with 15 weights or so. And just random combinations of two weights are, are plotted against one another, where both of the weights are obviously varied, right, um, to the left and to the right. And the corresponding error value is recorded. So is this useful? What exactly can we derive from this visualization? Well, I mean, first of all, it looks like neural network is governed by these flat areas. And it looks like there are a whole bunch of plateaus and steps and whatnot. So is it really just a really huge multidimensional you know, step letter? Well, I mean, it depends. Uh, the only problem with, well, actually there are quite a few problems with this visualization, but the most important problem is when you pick the two weights at random, you kind of make the assumption that the interaction between the two weights would be meaningful. In other words, there would be some you know, correlation between them. But of course, that is not necessarily the case. Um, perhaps the two weights feed into two separate neurons quite you know, far away in layers and whatnot from one another in the network. And they just do not really correlate with one another. You can vary one and the other, but varying one doesn't have any effect on the other. And that clearly is going to lead to these flat areas. So while this is you know, a good first attempt, I suppose, it's not exactly realistic. It definitely doesn't capture you know, the, the grand scheme of things. So <laughs> this seems kind of you know, sub sub part. Perhaps we can do better than that. So if just picking to a random weight doesn't work, um, what do we do? How do we perhaps pick more than just two weights? And again, I already told you a dimensionality reduction can come to the rescue. So perhaps what we can do is we can try and combine weights using PCA, uh, create some you know, nonlinear projections or linear projection from a weight space to PCA space, and then perhaps look at the loss landscape alongside the principal components, right? So first and foremost, how are we going to um, you know, derive the principal components. The method proposed in 2004 by Cordes, Miroslav Cordes was to take an algorithm um, such as gradient descent, start it somewhere, train the neural network to convergence and record the entire weight vector after each iteration. And that of course then gives you a nice matrix of weights, right? And that for that particular matrix, you can then calculate the principal components. And there are a few notes to be said on that. First of all, the nice thing about this is once you do the PCA 
projection. And he also tried ICA, independent component analysis. So he tried kind of different versions of figuring out the principal directions in the search space. Um, and in the very same paper, authors already mentioned that this is, in their opinion, a good visualization, a useful visualization. Uh, but it does come with a few shortcomings. Before we discuss shortcomings, let's quickly try and see if this actually tells us anything useful. I guess uh, one thing I'd like to point out straight away is the lost landscape looks a bit less like this awkward step letter. So at least we know correlations between individual weights are captured a little bit better, right? And specifically in this paper, authors compared different types of networks that were trying to investigate the effect of various neural network hyperparameters on the properties of the lost landscape. So for example, on the left here, they were comparing a shallow neural network with just you know, inputs feeding straight to outputs, so really like a linear classifier, versus a slightly deeper network with um, a couple of hidden layers. And one can clearly see that adding hidden layers adds you know, complexity, adds ruggedness to the landscape, makes it perhaps harder to traverse. And on top here, we have a network with skip connections, kind of like residual connections on the left. And on the right, we have a network that is extremely wide. So it has only one hidden layer, but it has way too many neurons. So it's extremely over-parameterized. And if we compare the two, it looks like the residual connection has overall nicer shape, right? It looks like steeper gradients and whatnot, less flatness. So perhaps residual connections, if you compare, if you're trying to pick between the two, perhaps this looks more useful. Um, but still, um, like I said, authors acknowledge some uh, potential downsides of this particular approach. First of all, it's obviously a linear projection, so it doesn't quite capture the curvatures in the landscapes. This straight ravines in reality might be quite curved, and you will not really see that in the PCA space. And secondly, um, what exactly are you looking at? What is a principal component, right? It's a linear combination of all of these multiple weights, it's it's not very realistic, you know. It's it's not a true um, picture of the landscape. It's a potentially useful projection, but it might be misleading in some ways. Okay, so if this is not realistic enough, how do we then once again visualize neural networks in few dimensions that we can comprehend without oversimplifying, without straightening, you know, the curvy lines and whatnot? And um, one method that became quite popular recently is actually quite trivial and known as linear interpolation. So the idea behind it is, yes, of course, neural networks are very high dimensional. We can't visualize at all. But if you take two points in the search space, for example, the starting point, so your random, randomly initialized weights, and the final point, that's the convergence points, the supposedly minima that you have discovered, of course, uh, you know, each, both of the points are extremely high dimensional, right? But you can draw the line that connects these two points across your very high dimensional space. And yes, this line would not correspond to um, a training algorithm trajectory or anything like that. It's just a straight line. It's just a slice through the search space in one dimension. However, the authors who proposed this said, well, perhaps some dynamics that we can see along this line can still be useful, right? So what they said is take the two points and then just interpolate along those points, interpolate uh, just points in the weight space and just evaluate the network for every point on this line at some fixed intervals, right? And I mean, you decide how granular you want that to be. And a whole bunch of papers um, have been published that use this method to compare various techniques um, and claim that particular methods, particular modifications of the neural networks make the, make the problem easier to optimize. Um, so how exactly do you know whether what you're looking at is easier or harder to optimize? Well, for example, if you connect your starting points to the finish line, right, the, the end points, and you see that the loss along your interpolated line is a nice uh, monotonically decreasing curve, then you can say, okay, this looks easy. My algorithm at every single step, like along this line, clearly there was like an overall decreasing error towards the final point. So this kind of maybe can be interpreted as this nice big basin of attraction that the algorithm has experienced. 
And I can make the assumption that something like this was, you know, easy. So in this particular example, what we are comparing is training, uh, pre-trained neural networks. So these are CNNs. Um, the yellow lines here, nice smooth curve is for CNN that was trained, um, pre-trained on ImageNet and then subsequently um, fine tunes on Cypher 10 or something like that. And the blue line is uh, simply the very same network, but trained from scratch. Um, and orange lines also, I think, trained from scratch from some different random initializations. And I mean, looking at this picture, clearly, if we did pre-training, it looks like error decreased quite smoothly, right, along this linear interpolation. While if you started from random points, it seemed that for a while along your line, the error did not improve at all. So it was probably your algorithm, right, lost somewhere in the depths of the landscape until eventually it arrives at the final point. So anyway, the proposed interpretation was that the quicker it descends, the quicker, the more smoothly it um, descends, the easier is your problem to optimize. Here's another example, right? Sorry, can, can I just um, ask, where the, yes? Can I just ask you a quick question there? Yeah. Um. So so here you got your your sort of high dimensional space. You pick two points and you draw a straight line between them, just the interpolation between them. Um. But that sort of assuming there that you've got a Euclidean space. Um, is there any way to think about geodesics in this space? Can you think about it having a non-trivial metric? Um, I well, you mean uh, well, well? How would you interpret that, though? I mean, yes, like I suppose that's kind of how we think as humans, right? Euclidean distance is the one that makes the mm -hmm. most sense to us. Are you saying that the steps themselves should not be so linear, or oh, so? so um, I, I don't I, do, I, do you have concrete suggestions. Yeah, so I, I was actually talking to somebody about this yesterday that I remember um, the Shinichi Amari has this thing about using the Fisher metric um, for gradient descent, mm -hmm. where the Fisher metric is like a um, the metric over the the sort of parameter space that tells you that you may right. be on some curved manifold. And I wonder if you can yeah. think of this parameter space as being a curved manifold and actually like the straight line isn't the shortest distance in in some sense between the, the two right. points. Right, 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 right. I mean, for sure. I think this is a very, a very trivialized way mm -hmm. to slice through the search space. Um, and I think we also, at the end we discussed that maybe like looking at Hessians as well can be useful, mm -hmm. but I don't know how expensive vision metrics also would be. Perhaps mm -hmm. it can be approximated cheaply and whatnot. Sure. But of course, anything, you know, more um, informed, I guess, than just a straight line. I mean, there is lots of criticism about this method because it completely kind of ignores um, the trajectory of the landscape. And you just take this quick kind of, you know, zip line, right, from point A to point B. But what you see from, from above, right, from this perspective, question is, is it really kind of descriptive of what's really happening? And yeah, in my opinion, this is actually not a very good visualization, but I feel like something that kind of came from it, especially the visualization, the, the two-dimensional subspace, to me, that's a little bit more informative, but even there, maybe even for two dimensions, I mean, because we still will be interpolating, right? Um, in a similar way, you create this Euclidean grid, right? Over the two vectors. So perhaps um, as well, kind of thinking of, of different different ways of just, um, what's what's the word? Uh, enumerating, I don't know, uh, calculating distance. I think that's, that's a very good point. Because that's the thing, our intuition kind of breaks in high dimensions, right? We make these simplistic assumptions um, but perhaps none of this even makes sense. But, um, well, clearly some correlations were found that were useful. And what you see here on top is MNIST data set, handwritten digits, right? Everybody knows that versus the spiral data. And for the spiral data set, um, once again, what, um, well, in this case, um, the barriers were noticed by the researchers. And they said, well, again, if you're, error from point A to point B decreases monotonically, it's good. But if there is a barrier, if it goes up before going down, that kind of indicates that you have to climb over these mountains along the way, right? So like the shortest distance, well, supposedly the shortest distance in Euclidean terms is maybe just not a good trajectory. And that tells that you have to take some windy path. So perhaps that's harder. And we know, as a matter of fact, the spiral data set, the red and the blue spiral twisted along one another is actually quite a hard problem for a neural network to optimize. Okay, so these particular graphs were taken from a really nice paper. The title of it is, What Can Linear Interpolation of Neural Network Lost Landscapes Tell Us? And this paper is lovely because they don't just 
take this method and assume that it's the best. So they actually set out on a mission to evaluate the usefulness of this metric. So they, in, in this case, the authors try to evaluate these assumptions that, for example, the barriers, right, that you encounter along your 1D slice are indicative of, you know, subpar performance in some way or another. So they investigated a whole bunch of different variations of neural networks, pre-training versus no pre-training, data augmentation, batch normalization, different optimizers, et cetera, et cetera. And what they have discovered is things are actually all over the place. In some cases, no barriers are correlated with better test accuracy. So when you encounter no barriers, you end up with a nice uh, test accuracy and your neural network generalizes well, et cetera. In other cases, you get some lines we have, which have no barriers and they actually lead to worse accuracies, while lines with higher barriers actually lead to better accuracies. So, I mean, maybe one can say that a lack of barriers makes your training task easier, but would you really end up in a better place at the end of the day? Um, well, that's an open question, but in this particular case, the author states that uh, they do not think that barriers are really indicative. Um, and in general, let me just read this out loud. I really love this paragraph. Authors say that they conclude that the shape of the linear path from initial to final state is not a reliable indicator of test accuracy. Uh, they believe that publishing this negative results is important due to the widespread use of the linear interpolation methods. So this method still features a lot in papers that try to look into lost landscapes, but the reality of it is this correlation between the shape of the linear interpolation and you know, the final behavior that maybe, maybe I'm trying to predict, it's kind of shaky. But still, we are trying something, right? At least we get some visualization. Can we maybe get something better than just this line? Well, how about we ascend right from one dimensional um, plane to two dimensional? For example, um, technically you can take a two-dimensional slice through um, through any 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 through through any space of any dimensionality. For example, if you have three-dimensional cube, you can uh, take two vectors, define kind of a subspace with those two vectors, and slice it through the cube. So on the left is the cube, and on the right-hand side is your two-dimensional projection of the cube. So similarly. Nothing really stops us from once again converging on some points or picking some points at random in the neural network search space. And then from that point, pick two vectors, two directions, right? And those two vectors would obviously then span a particular two dimensional subspace. And you can easily sample the search space along the grid, right? Defined by these two vectors. And then if you evaluate the loss at every point in the grid, you get some kind of a two-dimensional projection of the neural network loss landscape without um, modifying it in any way, you know, without um, kind of projecting into principal components or anything like that, you get a little slice of reality that your algorithm is experiencing. In particular, so this method has been used by a few researchers, but a particular striking result was obtained in 2018 by How et al. in the paper Visualizing the Lost Landscape of Neural Nets, a very generic title for a very specific approach. Uh, but yeah, what they propose in this paper is something known as filter-wise normalization. And the idea is quite simple. You once again find some convergence, convergence point X. You pick two random directions at that point. Then you normalize these two vectors so that you know, they are comparable in terms of their magnitudes. And once you've normalized them, they obviously then define the subspace on which you can sample individual points on the grid and calculate the error. And if you do it on a fine enough level, if your grid is extremely, extremely fine grained, then the third dimension obviously becomes the loss itself. And you can get this extremely striking visualizations around the optimum that you have found. Um, so specifically in this paper that uh, proposed filter-wise normalization, authors have extensively studied the difference between skip connections versus uh, no skip connections. And um, I don't know if this example was cherry picked or if all of them looked like this, but the difference is of course quite striking. Without skip connections, the landscape looks 
really rugged, right? And all over the place with all of these hills and valleys and whatnot. While with Skip Connections, it's quite smooth. And this looks like a perfect little basin that should be extremely easy to optimize. Um, all right, so here's another example from the same paper. In this case, on the left, once again, we have the ResNet without skip connections, which is a bit counterintuitive. They took the ResNet and then they took the res out of the net. <laughs> you know, it's still a CNN, but the authors explicitly removed all the residual connections. Um, and on the left, you have the dense net that was kind of coming up mm -hmm. back in 2018, 2019. Dense net is also a CNN where every previous layer is feeding into every successive layer. So it's like this weird fully connected thing. So there is an abundance of skip connections, right? That hop over entire layers. And that produced a particularly smooth, beautiful basin around the minimum, according to these visualizations. So the bottom line that um, we can take from this is skip connections are really great. Definitely use them. And again, we know this empirically, but this gives us a very visual, striking visual explanation for why they work. Well, they just, you know, they give you the shortcuts, right? Make everything smoother and simple to optimize. Um, of course, generating visualizations like this is quite expensive since you need your, your grid needs to be extremely fine grained, right? For such a level of smoothness. So the authors also resorted to cheaper versions of the same visualization. These are just, um, well, it's the same. You technically can render this as a 3D map, right? But a map like this is, of course, um, cheaper to visualize. Again, what we have here is a comparison of different networks. From the left to the right, we have um, networks that increase in width. In other words, number of filters per convolution layer. Um, right. And we can clearly see that as you add more and more filters, as you make your networks wider, the basins also become kind of smoother and wider and supposedly, once again, easier to optimize. Great, so I personally think this visualization is quite useful and uh, the insights that we get from it seem to correlate really well with uh, something that we already know empirically, right? So it gives us this visual explanation for phenomena that we have observed doing our black box, start randomly and get somewhere kind of studies. But um, let's think of what else we can actually study with a tool like this. The very same authors um, studied a different phenomena, but the one that is particularly interesting to me is the hypothesis of um, flat versus sharp minima. So let me tell you a story of the flat minima folklore. So back in 1996, um, Hochreiter and Schmidhuber published a little paper where they made this proposition, hypothesis, I suppose, that if your minimum that you have discovered is flat, right, if its walls are not very steep, if it's kind of like wide at the bottom, then it's likely to generalize better than the minimum that is very, very sharp and narrow and has very, very steep walls. And the intuitive explanation that they gave for this is that um, when you go from your inputs, um, sorry, from your training data to your test data, the distribution might slightly shift, right? So that's kind of the problem with all data. We never know the true distribution of reality. Our data sets only approximate the distribution, only capture it to some extent, right? You never look at reality itself, only at some footprint of reality. So there are usually the slight differences between the distribution of your training set and the distribution of your test set. You can't make them identical, right? So the idea here was that if your minimum is flat, then this slight shift in the distribution between the test set and the training set should not really alter the error so much. While if your minimum is very narrow and steep, then even the tiniest shift of the distribution might kind of kick your algorithm, kick your solution you know, out of, um, just like kick your cock out of the mechanism, the whole thing will break down. Basically, the error will shoot up drastically. And I think this kind of makes sense intuitively, but uh, what really fascinates me about this is the hypothesis made in 1996 was not exactly supported by any kind of concrete theory or experiments. It was a proposition. I do not really think the authors have you know, proven it in any sort of you know, way. 
but it kind of turns from an assumption, from a hypothesis to fact. And as a matter of fact, there's an entire field of research known as um, SAM, in other words, sharp, sharpness aware minimizers, where algorithms were explicitly designed uh, to be biased towards discovering minima that is flatter. And there is evidence that actually works, right? So I guess that's great. But still, it's a little bit concerning, I guess, that we take some suppositions and just start treating them as axioms without necessarily verifying them properly. And of course, some papers also are coming out still, and this is just one of them. I simply love the title, Flatness is a False Friend, that try to actually challenge this claim, challenge this assumption, challenge this axiom, and say, well, maybe we are oversimplifying it. Do all flat minima really generalize better than sharp minima? What if you reparameterize the space? And then suddenly, you know, we can, we can, for example, artificially by reparameterizing the loss landscape, we can artificially turn flat minima into sharp, and turn sharp minima into flat and the generalization properties do not change, stuff like that. So there is quite a bit of debate about it, but don't really have a concrete answer. And these particular authors who um, proposed fields of normalization published a little paper, I think it's in Europe's workshop, where they investigated exactly that. They said, well, you know, let's, let's just visualize it and see what we can see. So on the left, what you see, it's obviously the spiral data set, right? The obnoxious one that's not easy to, to fit but they managed to fit it really well with the neural network. And this example on the left is a good solution that has 100% um, accuracy on the training set as well as the test set. And if you visualize it using that, me that method of the filter normalization, right, the 2D subspace, you get this nice round little basin, which looks pretty flat at the bottom. But then the authors ask themselves, great, so how are we going to check if sharp minima generalizes badly? How about we find the worst possible solution that we possibly can find? And what they did is they kind of reverse engineered it a bit. They said, how about we explicitly tell the neural network to find such weights that the training error is minimized, but the generalization error is maximized. So they were basically explicitly teaching the neural network to overfit. They asked it explicitly to overfit as much as it can to only fit the training data, but not the test data. And of course, they have managed to find this ultimately bad solution where the accuracy on the train data set was 100% and the accuracy on the test um, set was 7%. Uh, look, they couldn't make it to zero. So neural networks still managed to guess at least some of these points correctly, even if by accident. And subsequently, they have, um, of course, visualized the minimum, and they've discovered that in the second case, in this adversarial training example, explicitly training networks to generalize badly, um, minimum was indeed rather sharp. However, I, I'm not a big fan of this approach. I feel like this looks quite a bit of like cherry picking. Like, do you really have to go out of your way and find the worst possible solution? Or should you rather perhaps just train a whole bunch of neural networks, you know, from a hundred different starting points, and then maybe visualize a hundred of those minima, uh, perhaps quantify the sharpness and correlate that to the actual generalization performance. Maybe that would be more realistic, but no, that this is the path the authors took. Um, they claim that this really supports the belief that flat minima generalizes better. I still have my doubts and I hope to come back to it if time allows. Um, okay, so 2D subspaces really are quite cool. Um, another very interesting paper that used a similar kind of approach is um, the one called Lost Services, Mode, Connectivity, and Fast Ensembling of DNNs. And since the picture is worth a thousand words, let's see if I can actually play this YouTube video. So this video was made by Javier Idiami. He is a really cool guy. He has a website called lostlandscapes.com. And he spent a lot of time visualizing neural network loss landscapes using these 2D subspaces, right? What in this particular case he is visualizing is two separate minima are discovered, right? By just training your neural network twice. And then um, you define a curve, parameterized curve, like a Bezier curve that you, you want that curve to connect the two points. And at first, of course, the points are not exactly connected. It's just a random curve connecting the two. But over time, you can train the parameters to basically minimize the error along the curve. 
And with that experiment, um, it was discovered that for a really wide array of different deep neural network architectures, we can always find this path between two minimum to minima that actually has error of more or less the same value. And in this particular paper, authors actually, maybe I should just replay it. In this particular paper, authors um, used that. So they said, well, how about then you find um, like a couple of minimum and that minima, and then using the Bezier curve, you find the minima in between, minima that are just hiding, you know, in this crinkle, in this manifold, and ensemble them together, right? It's like you find two minima, and by collecting them, you find, you discover this whole like basket full of minima that's all uh, actually correspond to somewhat different solutions to the problem. And that to me is really fascinating. So again, one of the really interesting discoveries that all of these various minima that we find might indeed be connected in this one huge manifold, right? Um, discovery like that can only be made if you do in fact consider the loss landscape of the neural net. All right, let's see. So, 2D subspace visualizations are obviously great. They really led to really cool discoveries and insights. Um, how reliable are they exactly? Obviously, we pick these two random directions, right? What if we pick two different random directions? And authors preemptively thought about it and did some studies. So on the left, you see various uh, 1D subspaces in this case. Also, like you find the points and then you just have a single vector rather than two vectors and you evaluate loss along that vector. And it's a different random vector every time around the minimum. But if you do sample from the minimum, then you tend to get this, you know, somewhat reliable lines, as a matter of fact. And if you do the same for 2D subspaces, of course, it's a bit harder to overlay them on top of one another. But once again, every two random weights give you a slightly different picture, but the overall properties seem to be consistent, right? All four of these look somewhat rugged, and the minimum looks somewhat like a stretched ellipse. So, of course, every single subspace is just a tiny sliver of the search space, but it still gives you um, some visualization that captures some general properties of the landscape at hand. Although it's still important to remember that by picking just two random vectors along which you plan to visualize, you are, um, you are reducing the dimensionality ridiculously, right? And of course, you are just looking at the tiny little sliver and there could be wormholes behind your back and you would not even know it. So in that vein, perhaps we should actually then aim to not just base our conclusions on you know, one sample, one visualization that you decided to, to pick, but perhaps we should actually accumulate the statistics of a multiple sample and base our observations um, on the statistics rather than a single snapshot that you take. That also takes the cherry picking out of the question to some extent. And this is where I would like to revisit the question of flat versus sharp minima. So like I said, my problem with current studies in this particular field, let me check how much time I have left. Okay, so it's been 40 minutes. I don't know, am I supposed to st stop at 45 minutes or can I speak for an hour? No, no, you can, you can carry on. Absolutely fine. Yep. Okay, great. So my problem with current studies of flat versus sharp minima is that most authors um, kind of approach this dilemma from one of the two sides. They either come in to refute the claim or they come in to support the claim. But I haven't seen many papers that just objectively try to evaluate is there really a strong correlation between the sharpness and you know, the subsequent generalization properties of the minima. And this is exactly what we set out to do with an honor student of mine, Isabel, whose surname happens to also be Bosman. We are in no way related, but I guess that's South Africa. So um, our aim was quite simple. We wanted to quantify the steepness, the sharpness, right, of these attraction basins. And obviously, you quantify the generalization error by just calculating it and simply see how the two correlates, right? You can, you can of course, calculate some correlation coefficients. For that, um, we realized that there is actually no known kind of obvious way of easily quantifying sharpness. Most sharpness metrics rely on some kind of Hessian metrics approximation which is somewhat expensive. I guess it can be done if you just look at the diagonal, but even so, Hessian captures sharpness very, very locally, right? Around the exact points. And um, 
there is a paper that actually kind of evaluates the Hessians um, as opposed to like some other ways of looking at it. And they claim that it seems that if you rely on Hessians, they maybe quantify the ruggedness, like how kind of bumpy your, net, your landscape is, rather than how sharp or flat the entire basin of attraction is. So we wanted to propose some metric of capturing the global shape rather than like the shape, the curvature at this particular point that you ended up in. And this is the algorithm that we proposed. Let me just quickly walk you through it. So uh, first of all, of course, to quantify the sharpness of the minimum, you need to find a minimum. So that's the first thing you do. You use an optimizer and you find a minimum where the optimizer converges. Once that is done, you are going to randomly generate a mask. In our case, we chose 50% of the weights. So we randomly pick 50% of the weights. In, in this 50% of the weights, we either shift them slightly to the right or slightly to the left. And by shift, I mean literally adding a little step to the right or subtracting a little step to make that weight go to the left instead. So we have these two directions, the positive and the negative direction, right? So you do that for one mask, but of course, that's a very random selection of weights. Maybe we happen to do it in a biased way. So to avoid bias, to get proper statistics, we did that 30 times. So for every step, essentially, for, for every point you generate this mask, right? Uh, then for the mask, you do the left and the right shift, you re-evaluate re the fitness, and then you repeat this process 30 times. Well, for every step, your mask is different. So it's 30 different uh, weight samples, so to speak, where for each sample, you shift it to the right or you shift it to the left. Um, once you are done collecting your sample of 30, you can increase the step slightly and repeat the process. And we do that once again for many different shifts. In this case, the shifts go from 0.01 to 0 0.1. So you just gradually, in this case, linearly increase this shift that you add to the weight. And remember, for every single point, we are going to do this 30 times for you know randomly chosen 50% of the weights. So you can then take this samples that you generated for each shift and plot it as, as a box plot, right? Along your x-axis, where x-axis is basically the shifts. And of course, the y-axis is the loss, which can be the training loss or the testing loss, depending on what you're trying to visualize. And this actually gives you a really lovely two-dimensional visualization of the basing, you know, with the stats, not based on just two random vectors, but hopefully we sampled quite a lot, right, of the weight space along the way. And it does actually give you an idea of whether where you converged was in fact looking like a basin or not at all. And once that is obtained, you can, of course, use some statistics over this sample, right, to quantify the sharpness. Um, we did it in a few different ways. You're welcome to read the paper. The title is there. But you can, for example, take the highest loss value, or, well, highest difference between the minimum and the loss on the left and on the right, and add the two together. Or you can do average um, average highest across your entire sample. There are many different ways to do that. We considered a few in our paper. But uh, what matters is you have hopefully a reliable enough sample to give you an estimate that you can trust of how sharp this basin in fact is. And after that, um, I mean, the rest is really quite simple. You, of course, have to get a whole bunch of different minima. So what we did is we trained each network a hundred times for different data sets. Simplest one was the well-known and loved Iris data set. So on the left, what you see is the flattest minimum we could find, and it does indeed look extremely flat, right? But these are all shown on the same scale just for comparison's sake. And on the right-hand side is the sharpest that we could find. And as you can see, these box plots are quite wide, right? So in this case for Iris, we could see that in some dimensions there was sharpness, but in other dimensions, right? I mean, there probably was quite a bit of flatness, which once again corresponds to what we know about neural networks. Lost landscapes tend to be very like ill-defined in a sense, ill-posed Ill problems where in some ways you have a lot of gradient information and other ways are irrelevant, right? So there you will have quite a bit of flatness. But anyway, um, now that we have found a hundred different minima, we obviously had the trade and the test error for both, and we could correlate that with the sharpness, and we did that. So these are just two different sharpness metrics, maximal average, I guess it doesn't matter. 
Um, okay, so what, what can we see? Duplet minima actually generalize better. Just by looking at the mean, at, at these um, pictures, if you look at the train versus the test, it actually looks like in both cases, the minima are kind of close to zero, right? In both cases. But if you look at the correlation, I mean, it does look like there is somewhat of a positive shift, somewhat of a correlation. It's not super strong, but it's definitely there, right? So for the Irish data set, I can say we definitely did observe some positive correlation between sharpness and um, sh sharpness of generalization. So in this case, the flatter it was, right, the better it generalized. Exactly what that belief of earlier told us. And here is just another picture from the same paper. We did this for a bunch of data sets. So this is again for a very well-known benchmark, the MNIST data set. So again, on the left is the flattest minimum, on the right is the sharpest one. It's interesting that the sharpest one was quite asymmetric, probably because we used ReLU, right? So for larger shifts, when you like when you increase the weights, you're more likely to shift ReLU to the positive side where signal increases, while when you reduce the weights, you're coming closer to like negative ReLU, right? Where it's likely to not produce anything at all. So that's the explanation for asymmetry. But um, besides that, once again, um, if you compare the training and the test for the flattest, objectively flattest and sharpest, I mean, both seem to be generalizing kind of decently in this case. And the reality of it is, if you look at the correlation plots, we actually did not notice any significant correlation between the sharpness and the generalization for the MNIST data set. And generally speaking, the higher the dimension of the problem became, the less important sharpness seemed to become, which is quite interesting, but well, that's, that's, that's what the numbers told us. Can, can I just ask you a so quick question? So what can you... Oh, sorry. Of can, course. Can I ask you a quick question there? Um, so for, for this results, um, did the did it matter how large the network itself was? So you can train MNIST on relatively small networks or relatively large networks. And does that alter the correlation between the sharpness and the generalization? That's, that, that's actually a very good question because we did not uh, technically do such a study. I think it would be quite interesting, right? Because you can take, uh, I don't know, iris and like over parameterize it ridiculously. Yeah. And perhaps in that case, the correlation will also just diminish. Mm -hmm. But because these experiments were a little bit expensive, the student was kind of running it on her own laptop and whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. for, each, for each problem in this case, she kind of just used the optimal, you know, optimized architecture that was known to be able to fit the problem well. So it definitely wasn't underparameterized, but I think you make a very, very valid point. Um, perhaps it's not even the problem, maybe it's just the dimensionality. Mm -hmm. And again, maybe it has something to do with like distances and all of that. Maybe, I mean, maybe this matrix is still not reliable because we still apply the Euclidean thinking to it. But I think that's definitely something that we should look at and should be quite easy because obviously all the code is already there just to verify this once yes. again. Thank you. Um, but overall, I feel like the takeaway is not that flat minima do not generalize better. In some cases, they do. The takeaway is this very general statements, blanket statements, such as flat minima generalize better and sharp minima are awful. They're just oversimplifications. Um, they don't capture the true complexity of what's happening, and we should avoid these, um, you know, we should avoid such statements because they can be deceptive, right? They can kind of lead us in the wrong direction, especially when they start to sound like the truth, even though we don't quite know if it is the truth or not. So bottom line is, I guess, question everything. Okay, let's see, I might skip a few things. I'm still on 52 minutes. Um, just another study, this is directly from my PhD. I studied a whole bunch of different things, but one that was quite interesting to me was the modality of neural networks. Um, modality, I mean, that term is obviously used in many fields in many different ways, but specifically in the fitness landscape, um, fields, uh, when we speak of modality, we typically speak of the properties of minima in neural networks. And again, when you uh, look at the literature regarding the presence or absence of local minima neural networks, there is a lot of conflicting opinions. Some state that, uh, well, at least if you look at early papers, specifically on XOR, uh, there were scientists who kind of published findings where they said, I found minima on XOR, you know, exactly four of them or something like that. And others were like, no, I can theoretically prove there are no local minima. All of them are settled points, et cetera. And the current consensus is that 
if you overparameterize the network enough, if you just increase the dimensionality, like even artificially, if you make the network larger than necessary, large enough networks um, tend, uh, in large enough networks, the local minima tends to become global minima. So again, this is something I was quite interested in, in visualizing and just empirically investigating. So for that, I proposed a little technique known as loss gradient clouds, which maybe I will quickly try to explain. So uh, we did some gradient sampling, but this doesn't really matter. I think I'll skip that. Um, so generally speaking, for fitness landscape analysis, um, most methods are reliant on statistics over a whole bunch of samples. So just like we did with Isabel for my modality metrics, I aimed to sample the landscape many times, right? We generate multiple different kind of walks through the search space from some random point to hopefully a point that is more or less close to the minimum. Um, in my case, I basically like a somewhat stochastic version of gradient descent, but you can technically just take Adam or whatever and just train your neural network many, many different times from many different starting points, and that would be your samples. And once you've collected your samples, um, what you can do is once again resort to scatter plots. Scatter plots can be ridiculously informative. And this particular scatter plot has its own name. Um, I call it the loss gradient clouds. And the idea is simple. So if you have a whole bunch of these high dimensional weight vectors, right? What can you plot to get an idea regarding the, the minima? Like what are the properties of minima? Well, obviously a minimum is a point where there is no gradient, right? Um, of course, gradient vector itself is high dimensional, but nothing prevents you from calculating the norm of the, of the vector, right? Calculate the magnitude of your gradient vector. And if the magnitude of your gradient vector is zero or very close to zero, then you are probably looking at a point that is rather flat. Um, on top of that, you, if you are really interested in whether it's a minimum or not, you probably want to know if, if, it's, if the point is stationary, right? If there is no gradient, that's good. But for it to be a minimum, it also needs to be convex. How do you estimate convexity? Well, the easiest thing to do is just to do some Hessian matrix analysis, look at the eigenvalues, and they're going to tell you the story. So if you find points that are, in fact, um, that do not have any gradients, where the gradient is zero, and where the curvature is, um, well, where, where the point is convex, you know, you're looking definitely at a minimum. Where it's global or local is easy to find out. You just check its error value, right? If the error is zero and the gradient is zero and the point is convex, that's the global minimum. On the other hand, these three dots here, and remember this is over many different samples, um, specifically, I tried to sample 10 times more than the number of weights in the network, which of course becomes a very expensive for large neural networks, but you know, that's the price you pay. Oh, sampling is expensive, but it can tell you really good stories. So this particular example is for the XOR data set. And for the XOR data set, one can very clearly see that if you sample it thoroughly, um, and in this case, I just split the points into the ones with convex versus like saddle curvature according to the Hessians. Uh, you clearly can see that a lot of the times your algorithms do find points that have a non-zero error, zero gradient, and according to Hessian, at least locally, they are convex. Okay, so I don't have much time, so I'll quickly zoom through this. Uh, specifically, I already told you the theory says that if you over-parameterize the network enough, all local minima become global minima, and that's a super useful property. But um, one particular thing I was interested in studying is, is there a difference on how you over-parameterize the network? Is there a difference between adding layers versus just adding neurons to a layer? So what you're looking at here is um, the width, where you keep just like one hidden layer or many hidden layers, but you just like increase, I think in this case, it was just one hidden layer, and I simply increased its width every time multiplying it by two. And with the increase in width, you can actually clearly see how the number of attractors, right, that my sampling has discovered, my gradient-based sampling has discovered, number of attractors shrank very visibly from, you know, just four for a very small network to three for a slightly wider network to just two with an even wider network. And in this case also, of course, the wider network became the less convex it became. And I also did the same for layers. So in this case, the width remained the same. Every layer was only two neurons wide. And I just kept stacking more and more layers. And interestingly enough, um, when you just add layers, you know, ad infinitum, 
it doesn't really seem to, it changes the convexity properties significantly, but the actual number of attractors actually doesn't change. They stop being convex, right? So I suppose from local minima, they turn to saddle points, but um, they still remain stationary points where, where your algorithm technically might get stuck. And it's a bit hard to see here, but here in sort of big ellipse, there are actually three little dots. So the conclusion was that you can't just stack more layers. Skinny deep networks are not as good as networks that are deep as well as wide. With it has uh, something important. This throughput in your network is quite essential, basically, to successful training. Okay, I think I should really wrap it up. I'm probably out of time. So this is just also from the same paper where we will start an architecture, but this is for MNIST. And generally speaking, for many high dimensional problems, we notice this clear split with the samples into steep and kind of shallow gradient cluster. And this is just a hypothesis, but to me, it's explanation kind of makes sense, right? So these very steep gradients and low error probably corresponds to the sharper minima, right? While these kind of uh, slower cluster, the secondary cluster is the one with lower errors, but also, I guess, well, sorry, it's high errors, but lower gradients. So, I mean, in my, in my kind of thinking, I kind of thought about them as sharp versus flat minima. As we know, flat minima is supposed to be better and I mean, these particular graphs are colorized according to the gradient, uh, sorry, according to, to the generalization error. So the redder you are, the higher, the, the lower the error, the redder you are, the better. And in this case, one can clearly see that the sharp minima are kind of yellow, right? And the flat minima, well, not the minima, the flat attractor, right? The flat basin looks redder. So the flat stuff seems to be generalizing better, actually. However, as you once again increase the width as well as the depth, these two clusters, the split into sharp versus wide, um, it seems to kind of um, disappear, right? The two merge into one another. So it seems that once again, the more high dimensional your neural network is, the less important this whole split between this versus that becomes. There is all the stuff in between and you just end up with, first of all, ridiculously high gradients. Uh, but yeah, perhaps we'll focus on something that's not really that relevant. Okay, um, yeah, studied a bunch of other things, but of course there is no time to go through all of that, but you're welcome to check my Google Scholar page if you're interested in this. It's, I think, let's see how well I do on time. We have, oh, I'm just over one hour, so I'm, I'm more or less okay. But we have re officially reached the end of my talk and the end of this hike. So just one slide to quickly summarize everything uh, or more or less everything that we've covered, I think that visualizing neural network loss landscapes can really help us to open up the black box and understand this really complex optimization problem that we kind of try to solve blindly half of the time. Um, you can answer all kinds of questions with these tools, uh, such as how hard is your problem? How does it change when you change certain hyperparameters? Maybe you can even use these properties to predict how to change your hyperparameters to end up with better final solutions, which solutions potentially are better than other, and of course, how do we design better algorithms? I also think there is a lot of future research here, lots of things that can still be done, can still be discovered. Just understanding general fundamental properties with these tools, I think is very important and very much possible. Um, I am quite invested in this idea that maybe we can discover certain transformations of the loss landscape that will make the search easier for the algorithms. And I think the lowest hanging fruit is just using these estimations, right, to make adaptive algorithms. For example, once again, we tend to just use Adam or RMS probe or something like this, one of these algorithms that accumulates the gradients over time but it's done in a very static way. And if you could actually take the trajectory of your algorithm, use that as a sample of the search space, infer some properties of the search space from the sample that you are anyway collecting because you are busy traversing the search space and uh, use these properties to actually guide your learning rate, for example. I think something like that can be done quite easily and I think it can potentially significantly improve the conversion speed and maybe even accuracy of good old gradient descent. And on that note, I will apologize for taking longer than necessary, but I am now done with the talk and I'm happy to take some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anna. That was uh, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I think it's a, a problem which is not discussed nearly enough and is clearly super, super important. So thank you very much for, for telling us about it. Um, yeah. Are there any questions from anybody?
I see a hand. I think you can maybe oh. just unmute yourself and speak up. Oh, I, I think that was applause. Um, oh, <laughs> thank you. I'll, I'll take that. Sure. So I, I think it it was just a super, super clear talk. Um, and and I know I, I saw people nodding along throughout. Um, so I, I know that you've definitely got people thinking. Um, I think the lovely thing about visualizations is, you know, they are so visual. I think they're quite easy to appreciate. And that's something yeah. that, that really appeals to me. Like this is kind of on, on the verge of turning into art. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, there, there's a question uh, just written there, and then there is a question from uh, Shwaibu as well. Um, Shwaibu, maybe if you want to unmute yourself. Okay. Oh, can... uh, thank yeah, go ahead. Thanks for giving this opportunity to ask. Uh, thank you very much, the presenter. We really appreciate uh, your thoughts. Um, I'm Shwaibu Sani, so I'm one of the student who enrolled in uh, Professor Shock uh, class for this uh, for this semester, also my colleague for this semester. Okay, so my question is about the uh, the loss function during the gradient descent optimization. So my question is sometimes uh, maybe I usually I train my model using TensorFlow. So but sometimes when I try to visualize how they loss and biases changes over the training, but I see a lot of, uh, uh, maybe a lot of arrays of data. So I'm really confused about that. Maybe if I can get more insight about this, yeah. Arrays of data, you mean there are like different runs or just different, uh, because I mean with weights and biases, we typically just get the training curve, isn't it? So it's just like the error as yeah. it changes over the epochs. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Are you asking if you can infer anything about what the landscape from that? Well, for example, if your learning rate is just too large, you tend to see a lot of oscillations in, in the curve. I mean, there are kind of clear connections between what's happening in the loss landscapes and what happens to your algorithm. That's why uh, usually the first thing I tell the students when their neural networks want to train is, have you optimized the learning rate? The learning rate is ridiculously important because if you don't optimize it, you will oscillate forever or outright diverge. Um, something also that I kind of picked up, like a feeling, I guess, that we have in this community of loss landscapes is that when you think about them, neural like loss landscapes are kind of made of these ravines, right? It also goes with this idea of the manifold that connects all the different minima. So as you train, you uh, you want to find kind of a good ravine, and usually the the further you um, minimize down the ravine, the error tends to it decreases further and further as you kind of go into infinity. I don't know if that's answering the question, but yeah, it's not that that easy to kind of directly map just the training error itself. But I think, I mean, like I said, it is a sample. And even just by measuring the amount of oscillations, right, um, you can probably find some correlations between that and like learning rates or something like that. Um, there is also a question in the chat. Let me read that. Can we use neural nets to help with this problem? Then answer by stating so. Uh, with with what problem exactly? I don't know if I just missed, uh, but maybe I didn't read this early enough. So can we use neural nets to help us train neural nets? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we can, to help understand the landscape. Well, I mean, I, I guess the problem with neural nets is that what they learn is hard to visualize, right? But I mean, maybe you can train a neural network to discover some mapping between quantifying properties of the search space and, for example, like in a regression setting, predicting what your parameters should be set, set to or something like that, right? Because if correlations exist, it might be quite complex and nonlinear, but maybe if you give it enough inputs. There is another subfield of fitness landscape analysis. And again, this is from the evolutionary side of, of things known as exploratory landscape analysis. I know terminology seems redundant, but the whole point of ELA compared to FLA is that ELA focuses on um, estimating very cheap um, features of the search space. So they say, do like very simple stats. Don't do like too many samples, like make your features as cheap as possible and generate lots of them. And then if you have a whole bunch of features of the landscape that you can approximate on the fly, then those features can be fed into a machine learning algorithm 
that maybe then helps you adapt your algorithm and well the actual algorithm it's like it's it's a bit of a oh, what's what's the word uh, like meta optimization yeah, it's a heuristic but definitely doable okay let's see um, i think uh, sinjin had a question there uh, yes hi thanks for the talk um yeah i think and then the conclusions you mentioned the idea of an adaptive uh, learner how do you think mm -hmm. how do you relating to current meta learning methods like meta rl or meta evolution etc um how does it relate to that i don't think i know that much about it uh, like, can, can you kind of give me a, a meta meta learning in a nutshell again yeah. is it like a neural network making predictions for a neural network yeah, exactly. So there'll be one one learner guiding the other learner essentially, and I'm just thinking that maybe that's what's happening in the learnings where it's, it's guiding the um, the learner via observing its trajectory through the, through the. Lots yeah, of well, I think with with meta learning, the question I guess is always what do you give right to your meta learner? Like, what kind of inputs does does it go on? Does it just observe the trajectory? Can you? It's it's almost like with fitness landscapes, we go back a little bit to handcrafting features, right? Because obviously you can ask the neural network to do all the hard work for you and just say, ah, I have a trajectory, like if there's anything useful and figure it out, like here's an LSTM, treat it as a time series, see if you can pick anything out. But I mean, we can sort of as humans quantify, like if it's flat, like neutral is important, like rugged, if it's very oscillating, like if it's oscillating or not, that's important. So you can kind of manually, I guess, craft these features, but technically, yeah, I mean, I guess a neural network can also extract that from the tra trajectory itself. And then you can automate the whole, the whole process. As, as long as you kind of make the link between what do I experience as I go along and if I'm experiencing something, do I know what needs to change to kind of, you know, improve my experience and hopefully lead me in a better direction? Like, can I identify that I'm stuck at a settle point? And, and what do I do in that case? Yeah, I guess that's kind of why I'm asking, because I've seen a lot of research using reinforcement learning to try and, um, you know, optimize yeah. the optimizer in that sense. So it makes, like, the way you're talking about this from feedback, that makes sense to have an adaptive learner there, uh, at least from mm. how I, but yeah, that's... Uh, a good point. I mean, for sure, there are different links. I think up to up to the stock, I should go and uh, Google some some papers in that field. Wonderful. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap things up now, I'm afraid. But thank you so much again, Anna, for a fantastic talk. Um, uh, everybody has Anna's email address there. So if you have more questions, you can always send her a message. Um, but yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much again. Um, and I hope we will catch up soon. Many thanks. Thank you bye so much for having me. I've enjoyed myself. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure. Have a nice evening. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.